So we'll see. I, um, I handwrite a lot of my slides. And um, even native English speakers have occasionally said, maybe that's hard to read. So if you have trouble, don't, don't be afraid. Nothing here is that critical. I'm going to say everything. And, uh, all the, and everything I talk about, there'll be a link at the end. And you can pull this down, including all of the text. So if you'd rather read it, you can read it. This is Secrets and Lies. In 1942, the United States Marines enlisted 29 Navajo speakers to send secure messages um, over the radio. Now, the Navajo is a Native American tribe, um, and they have their own language. And there were eventually 421 of them that served uh, in the military through World War II, Korean War, and parts of the Vietnam War. Their secret code that they had was really mostly, they just spoke Navajo. They did have this very, very tricky um, cipher, so they could spell things out. They would just take each letter, pick a word out of English, and then just say the Navajo word. Very tricky. No one could figure this out. <sighs> Why Navajo, though? because almost nobody outside the Navajo Nation speaks Navajo. Certainly not in uh, 1940 or 42. Uh, it is a very obscure language. They thought maybe 30 people who weren't native speakers knew it. There were no books in it because the written form wasn't developed until 1940. So um, you couldn't study it if you didn't live kind of in the center of the US. Now, Navajo is the most famous. There were actually a lot of these. Uh, the Cherokee, the Hopis, and others, uh, tribes, all got in on this and were, and were called code talkers. This is the ultimate in what we call security through obscurity. Just nobody knew the language. Also, 1942, the pinnacle of German cryptography is the Enigma engine. Uh, which had been in use already for about 20 years, mostly for commercial usage. It had numerous iterations, improvements, and uh, the Enigma was security by design, right? You could just tell everybody exactly how it worked, and it would still be secure as long as they didn't know the exact configuration you used, the, the secret key, which changed every day. So, Depending on the model, the, the operator would do lots of things. They might plug in things. But it was really the same as a password that just changed every day. So we had the ultimate in security through obscurity matched up at the same time against the ultimate in security by design, right? So how'd that work out? Well, through three wars, we do not believe a single message by a Navajo code talker was ever deciphered. On the other hand, the uh, Enigma machine was actually cracked on a pretty regular basis. Security through obscurity is what we're going to talk about. Now, before I came to iOS, I worked in information security. I did audits and um, pen testing. I used to sneak into facilities. I did all kinds of crazy stuff. And um, I did incident response and everything. And when we um, I was trained that security, uh, I was trained in uh, Kirchhoff's principle, which is published here. And in what it said was a crypto system sh uh, should be secure even if everything about it is known, except for the key, right? There's some one secret. Now, my preferred way to say this is uh, Shannon's maxim, which is the enemy knows the system. Or as most security people say, Security through obscurity is no security. Different story. Alfred Charles Hobbes. Now, it, the Great Exhibition in 1851 in London, he demonstrated how to pick some of the most advanced locks of the day. Um, and people asked him, is that a good idea, right, to tell all the thieves uh, how to pick the locks? 
And he said, rogues are very keen in their profession and know already much more than we can teach them. This continues to be true today. Most door locks are basically pointless, right? They can be picked in less than 30 seconds, almost all of them. If you want to go see it, go to YouTube, search for lock, lock pick deadbolt. You will find people over and over and over again showing you how to pick a deadbolt. Similarly, uh, a, lot of key, a lot of institutions have what's called a master key system. So you have like one master key that can open lots of doors and then individual keys that can open just one door. Very common system. In, in uh, 2003, Matt Blaze published a paper telling you how you could take, if you had a key, a regular key, how you could upgrade it into a master key. Right? And it's a really easy thing. And it only hand, all you need to do, you, all you need are about 10 keys, uh, like blanks. And you can just try stuff out. And he shows you kind of how to do it. Um, that's not surprising, actually. That, the, people find vulnerabilities all the time. What was very shocking, though, was the locksmith community's reaction. They were very angry that he published this. They were very angry because they said, we've known about this for over a century. Why are you telling people? So they knew for 100 years, locksmiths, locksmiths lock manufacturers, and thieves all knew how to do this for 100 years. The only people who didn't know were people who buy locks. Rogues are very keen in their profession. So that's the thing. Security through obscurity is no obscurity. This is a lie. This is the lie. What's closer, security through obscurity is a thin layer of security. There's a big difference between these two stories, right? I talk about in one case where obscurity was quite effective, Navajo code talkers. I talk about another one where it was completely useless, protecting deadbolt or protecting master key systems. What's the difference? In the first case, Navajo code talkers were used for a reason. There were cryptographic ciphers, very good ones, or pretty good ones, available in 1942. They didn't need to use native speakers. They could have just encrypted them. Why did they use Navajos? Because it's faster. Working a crypto system was actually very slow in 1942. And so when you were in the field and you needed to call for help, it took too long to encrypt the message and then decrypt the message, whereas Navajos could just talk to each other and be pretty secure. They knew it could be cracked. They were making a choice. They got speed out of it. In the other case, lock manufacturers just didn't want to fix their locks. <laughs> right? They'd been doing this for a long time. They didn't want to fix it. And not surprisingly, it failed. So when you're using obscurity, it's very important that you know why and what you're trying to solve. So today, what we're talking about is the bad lands of security. We're going to talk about the uh, discredited and the disparaged. And we're going to talk about obfuscation. Obfuscation, obscurity. I keep using the word obscurity and obfuscation. I kind of use them back and forth. But they are different. They mean different things. Obscurity means I just don't tell anybody my secret. Obfuscation means I take trouble. I do things to try to make it hard for people to figure out my system. They're, both, they're related, but they're both very, very different than cryptography from encryption. In cryptography, we have some secret that is held outside the system. That's how you know that you have cryptography. If you can decrypt some data without any help from the user, you probably don't have encryption, right? Because the secret is not outside the system. It's inside the system. It looks like this. I have crypto that's, but I put my secret inside the system, and I just hope nobody looks. That's a very different thing. So if you're, taking, if you're using AES encryption, but you put the key inside the app, that's not encryption. We actually have a word for it. The word is scrambling. It's the 
word uh, security people use. Uh, it's not bad, but it's not encryption. Because you have put all of the scrambling logic that you need inside the app. It's just a fancy algorithm that you hope nobody looks at. Now, cryptography makes strong, provable claims. Right? It's, actually, it's a fairly technical field filled with a lot of math that looks like this. This is the kind of stuff when I studied cryptography, this, I copied this out of my homework. Um, you make proofs about things, right? But what's interesting about this, this is basically saying that in order to have a secure cipher, I need to know, which is what we mean by a PRP, I need to allow somebody to send me stuff, and I'll encrypt it for them and send it back, or maybe I send them random stuff. And they can't tell which is which. If they can tell which is which, then it's not secure. Now, nowhere did I say they have to actually decrypt it, ever. So for cryptographers, when they say things are insecure, they often mean things that you're not thinking of. You're thinking, oh, people can decrypt it. It's like, no, 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 they can just tell it's encrypted in the first place. You've already lost. This is very confusing for folks because cryptographers will, will say, or security people often will say, this is completely broken. And you don't understand, does that mean something I care about <laughs> or not? Real world security often doesn't care about all of these technical definitions anyway. What you care about is, can people do the thing I didn't want them to do? So having a strong, solid cipher, having all, all of your uh, cryptography correct, doesn't protect you against all kinds of attacks. There are other means for getting keys. And some algorithms um, that fail may, in fact, be sufficient for what you need to do. So the difference, but the big difference between security through obscurity through, um, and strong encryption is that if somebody steals your password that, for AES, that doesn't affect the thousands of millions of other people who use AES. But if somebody figures out your secret revert, you know, uh, obfuscation technique, how you've scrambled everything up, that kind of breaks everything. That breaks everyone who's using that technique. The real point of security is risk management. And a common way to say that is that we want to raise the bar that people get, has, have to get over. I actually tend to hate that term. I don't like when people say raise the bar because it tends to lead to a lot of pointless work. The idea of raising the bar is if the bar is high enough, people won't go over. That's good. But let's say I built a fence. And the fence is six inches tall. That's actually an effective deterrent. There are many, many people who would walk across your grass if there were no fence, who won't walk across your grass if the fence is six inches tall. Or what is that? What's half a meat? I don't know. Eight centimeters? I don't know. Short. <laughs> um, let's say I take that and I double it and I go from it's this tall to this tall. It's twice as big. I've made it twice as secure. No, you've done nothing. You wasted money, right? You have done nothing at all. There are zero people who would have stepped over a six inch fence and will not stick, step over a 12 inch fence. There are none. So when you're thinking about raising the bar, you need to be thinking orders of magnitude, right? If I made a you know, three meter fence, there are a lot of people who would step over a six inch fence and would not step over, would not try to climb a fence. So you always need to be thinking, how do I take this? How do I not make it a little harder? I have to make it a lot harder or it's not worth doing. Just don't do it. This is why we do things I told you that door locks are pretty much pointless. They're, they're kind of ridiculous. I actually have a friend who locked himself out and his, uh, Super, the the uh, building owner showed him how useless his door lock was. By walking up, he didn't even slow down. He took a crowbar, hit the door jam, opened the door. Didn't even stop walking. That's, he says, I'll, ha I'll have it fixed tomorrow. Right? But why do we lock our doors? You do it because you hope the thief will try your door and he'll go on. 
He won't take the time. He'll just, he'll try a bunch of doors. If it's open, he'll go in. So it is worthwhile. That's why you do it. There's an old saying, I don't have to be faster than the bear. I just have to be faster than you. That's funny. That's funny. Oh. <laughs> but raising the bar only works. It only makes sense if you know what's easy and what's hard. Right? It doesn't help you if you don't actually know what's hard. And so what we're going to talk about now are the kinds of things that attackers really do to your programs. So you know what, what is easy on them and what's hard. Because I see so many people, they do all these weird scrambles that literally have no impact. Because like, that's not what I do. How, do. how do we deal with it? The first is to understand the most common attacker you deal with every day. I promise you, you're dealing with bots. You're dealing with automated tools. If you have a free app on the App Store, I promise you, it is downloaded automatically onto a jailbroken device, broken, and scanned. Every single free app that happens to. Many pay apps. We know that it happens because security researchers do it themselves. I mean, we know that people who are in security do this. And there is zero chance that it's not also being done by people who would like to attack it. So what do they do? What does that look like? When I want to, what kind of tools might I use? Well, let's start with the simplest tool. This is the first tool I use when I'm trying to understand and, and reverse engineer an app. Strings. Strings, this just says, I want every string that is in your app that's more than eight letters long. And this gives a ton, a ton of strings, because every iOS app has a lot of strings in it, thousands. But you can get rid of most of them. Most of them you, you can easily see, because they're like Swift package names and they're um, Objective-C methods. They're very easy to see. And you can pull out the things like this. You go looking for URLs. You go looking for clearly passwords. You go looking for you know, some kind of API key or base64 encoded data. These things stand out. And you just pull them out. And you throw them into a database. And then when you think, I'd like an S3 bucket on Amazon. I wonder if I have a key that might get me an S3 bucket. And it's in my database. Maybe I'll just store stuff there. And you can pay for it. Now, maybe, maybe I want to get a little more complicated. Maybe I want to do something a little more. And um, I might go to something like this. This is my favorite tool. It's called Hopper. Hopper costs uh, about $100. Um, and it is a quite decent disassembler, uh, decompiler, and debugger. Now, if you have more money, there are much better tools. Uh, there's a, a very famous one called Ida Pro. It is several thousand dollars to purchase. Um, I mostly defend systems. I don't attack them professionally. So I buy Hopper because <laughs> it's $100. Um, but this does a, a, a very good job. And what does it look like? This is what you see when you just open up an app in Hopper. You get all of the symbols. So I can see all of your, all of your symbols. Um, Objective-C methods pop right out. Swift methods are often bridged to Objective-C. So they, they show up here, too. Don't think they don't. I can also pull out all the strings. Uh, I can switch over to a tab and get all of the, uh, all the strings. So I see all the same strings that I saw before with the strings command. I can get, this is kind of faint, but uh, this, is a, this is a demonstration of the code flow. Like, how does the, thing, how does the app work? Right? It'll just dump it out for you. How do the functions, how do the functions get called? And you can see where kind of the choke points are. And it can do this. Now, this is where IDA Pro does a much better job than Hopper, but uh, this, is a, this is a decompiler, and it will gen generate this kind of fake Objective C. And it may, you go, oh, well, that looks really complicated, except it's really not. Once you start reading it, you go, okay, this is an URL request. Right? That pops right out. So I know this is, this is networking code. And I can start walking through it pretty easily. Now, um, I had an interesting debate with a, uh, I used to say at this point that Objective-C code was much, much easier to reverse engineer than Swift code. 
And um, I happen to be talking to uh, the, uh, the, the guy who, who does a lot of jailbreaking himself. And he says, not quite. That Swift is actually uh, a little, that Objective-C um, can be harder to reverse engineer because so much of it compiles down to C. And that C is actually kind of hard because the optimizations are really good. If you want the one thing to obfuscate code, don't go spend money, turn on the optimizer. Having reverse engineered a lot of assembly code, I'll tell you, optimized code will make you pull your hair out. Right? The compiler will do more <laughs> to trash the, the sensible flow of your program than almost anything else. So in either case, though, I can promise you both Objective-C and Swift are subject to getting all this kind of stuff out. So that's kind of, those are the things that the most basic tools that they're going to see. So what should you do about it? The first and most important, Benjamin Franklin has a wonderful saying, three can keep a secret if two of them are dead. So what should you do? You should try to keep your secrets get them out of the app entirely. It is bad to have secrets inside your app. The first thing you should say, do I need a secret at all? I mean, is this actually something I need to hide? If I don't need a secret, then I don't have to worry about it. If you can't get rid of them, I like to say, how do I get them out of the app? Maybe I put them on the server. How do I, and I'll download them. This I really like. Say you have API keys that go to uh, like Amazon. Right? You have Amazon services. Never put those keys in the app. Uh, my favorite thing to do, what I, what I strongly recommend is send all of your messages to your own server and let your server talk to Amazon. This gives you control. This lets you decide. It, also, if you change your mind on how you're going to manage the back end, you can do that. If your keys leak, you can change them because they're not in the app. They're just in one place on the server. And people can't steal them out of your app. Out of your app. So I always like to do that. Now, sometimes people can't do that because the cost, it's usually because of cost, right? That running your own server that's taking every request and then forwarding it on and then, and then forwarding it back is too expensive. If even so, then I say, download your keys. Again, this gives you the power to at least change them if you have found they have been leaked. If your user has a login, it also gives you control. Authenticate users, not apps. People always ask me, how do I make sure that only my app can talk to my server? The answer is you absolutely cannot. There is no mechanism that will allow you to make sure that the thing talking to your server is your program. This is ve Even if you authenticate your users, you still can't. Even if they have a login, you can't know they didn't change the program. Cannot be solved. But at least, if you authenticate users, you can turn off their account if you see that they're doing bad things. Or if you uh, have a service where they pay money, right, you can cut down the number of users, which again, cutting down the number of accounts gives you control. You can go the other way, too. You can create things that are called uh, honey tokens. I sometimes, I sometimes like to do this. Um, Although we haven't caught many people with it, only, only once or twice. Um, but you put fake credentials in your code to be found. You put fake endpoints that you don't use. Now, the tricky thing is you have to make sure that it doesn't get optimized out <laughs> of the code. But you leave a string. And then if that ever gets tripped, right? if anything ever comes across this URL, which only exists in your code but is never used, that tells you somebody is scanning you. And now, at least you know, is this, is, are people attacking me? So I sometimes like to do that. The, the usual trick, if you, make, if you make these global variables, they will, uh, they will not be optimized out in Swift. Today, they may change that. So you, again, anytime you build things like this, you're going to have to check over time. The key point of all of this is you have to pay attention. You can't, there is no technology you can just throw in and it'll just solve your problem. I promise you, if you are not watching your server logs 
on an ongoing basis and keeping track of what people are doing, you're not going to catch problems. And there is no way to keep it secure. So you want to also be looking for, are unusual things happening? It, or am I getting strange requests? This is one of the biggest things I look for. Am I getting errors, lots and lots of errors on my API? Uh, that often means that somebody is probing your API. They're trying to understand it. So they're sending, they're sending data that isn't quite right. That's exactly, that tells you, I have a problem. Somebody is trying to break in here. OK, I've talked about getting secrets out of your app, but sometimes you have to have a secret in your app. You're not going to be able to fix it. For instance, the AP, your own API key to your, I said download all your API keys. Well, what if your API has a key? You, you need to have that one. And you have to have at least one to get you started, right? So how, how would we hide it? Let's talk about base64 encoding. Because this seems to confuse people. I have had so many people ask me, they say, so I have encrypted data. This is not encryption. This is trivial to reverse. This is an encoding. It is just base64. It's not a secret. You basically should never base64 encode a secret, ever. Base64 stands out as a big string. It goes in the string section. It's the easiest thing to find. Um, and you already have, the whole point of Base64 is to encode raw data. So you already had raw data. Why store it as a string? Just store it as data, right? So we might decode, you have this, you want to store it as just bytes. You can do that, you know, Base64-D takes a string of base64 and gives you raw bytes. Now, you're not going to be able to print those out because it's garbage, right? It's not, it's not ASCII. But you can run into my favorite tool, XXD. Built in, all Macs have it. Um, this is a hex dump tool. XXD-I says, make me an include, write this out in include file syntax. Turns out the C include file syntax is exactly the same as Swift syntax. So it dumps this out. You can just copy and paste it into your code. And now your key is just raw bytes, right? There's no string anymore. This doesn't jump out in the string section. But it does kind of jump out in the data section. So people will, we raised the bar a little bit. But if people are going to go look in your data section, this is what this tends to look like. You have lots and lots and lots of zeros. This section is filled with zeros. And then boom, you have that block of data. Uh, still kind of bad. We'll get, better. We'll, we'll get better at this a little bit later. This is better, but we can do even better. What if you have an ASCII string, like this big password, right? You should never have a string like this. Something's wrong. This string makes me very nervous because it's exactly 32 letters long. If a string is 32 letters long, I promise you it's an AES key. That's what it always is. An AES key has to be random. Has to be random. If they are, if you put, make just a little password, it, that's no good. So let's, how do we make it random? Well, you can read 32 bytes off of random, off of dev random, and send it to my favorite XXD again. This is now 32 completely random bytes. This is a good AES key. This is a lot stronger. This is so much stronger. This is a hundred trillion times stronger. I'm not making that number up. I mean, it's literally a hundred trillion times. Why? Every letter you can type on an English keyboard, the, all the kind of the normal characters, there's about 96 of them, right? 32, 96 to the 32 is how many possible, if you totally randomly, totally randomly picked your letters. And remember, that other one wasn't random, right? It read out as, as something you picked. 
And you divide it by, this is how many possible keys exist in AES. This is off by a factor of 100 trillion. The other, the other very nice thing about getting rid of those strings for your keys is that a lot, there are a lot of people who can uh, memorize a, you know, a key. Right? They see it, they go, oh, I, I've seen it in the code, I know what it is. Now, there are people who can memorize 32 random numbers instantly, but a lot fewer <laughs> than can just go, oh, I remember your key. And that leaves, a, that leaves API, API keys. So this is an Amazon key. It's not a real one, I made a random one. But um, you can't change this. This is Amazon, right? They, they have a rule. I mean, they gave you the key. You can't do anything about it. You can't turn it into data. That doesn't fix anything. It's still, it's still English letters. They're going to show up just as well. Because strings doesn't care if it's in the strings section. It just cares that they all look like ASCII letters. So we've got to do something more. So now we're actually going to do real obfuscation. And I built a little tool for this called Swift Mask. I'll have the, the stuff at the end. Um, but what, will we, what do we want to do? Well, we're going to take it, an Amazon token is 20 characters long. So we need 20 bytes. So let's get our 20 bytes, right? Pull it off a dev random. And we're just going to turn that into a data. And now we need a masking function. And the best masking function is XOR, which is the little hat, right? Little carrot. XOR is the only math cryptographers ever use. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> um, it, is, it is how cryptography is done, is with XOR. And so what we're going to do, this is just zipping up. It's just saying for every byte in the API, in the actual key, and every byte in the mask, just XOR them together and give me out the answer. It gives me another set of bytes. If you XOR these two bytes to get together, you get the original answer. But both of these are totally random. This is actually a, a cipher. It's called a one-time pad. It's actually the most secure. It is the only cipher that is provably 100% secure. You can, this, can, this cipher cannot be defeated. Um, in your case, it can because you're going to put both of these in your code. So it's just a scramble. But these are now random. And I can just put them back together. Um, I told you, though, they show up. They do show up. And so they create this little thing. And at least then, I mean, both keys are now wrong. They kind of make their own honey token, though. Nobody should ever show up trying to you know, log in with that set of bytes, because that set of bytes is nonsense. But my problem is <clears throat> it was created this way. So it shows up as this little block of 32. Well, what can I do about that? Now we're starting to get, now we're starting to get a little fancier. I can make dev random again. I'm going to pull just another 20 bytes. Just why not? Some number. And I'm just going to pad the thing. Now it's not exactly 20 bytes long. Now it's like 60 bytes long. Or I could make it whatever I want. It's just kind of ran Now it's just random bytes in the middle of a bigger block. And then I just pull off the actual key you know, is some subset out of it. Now, anyone who has a debugger is going to stick their debugger on your app, and they are going to pull this out in about five minutes. Right? This is not secure, but bots can't do it. Automated scanners can't do it. And it will force them to actually pull out a debugger. I want to make the attacker's life that much harder. Annoy them. What did I do? Yeah, whatever. We can go even further. And we can use another technique. I'm not really going to go into it. I just want to let you know it exists because I'm starting to explore it. It's called steganography. Steganography is the idea of hiding the message entirely such that the attacker does not know a message is there. One way we can do it. This is a very, very basic approach. So if I see this file in your bundle of gibberish, that's interesting. I wonder what that is. I should look into this. Maybe figure out what it is. If I see you have a license agreement, lots of people put their license agreement in. But I could go in and replace all the spaces 
And I'm going to use the en space, the n space, which is a special Unicode code that still looks like a space. And that's going to be binary 0. And anytime I use the m space, that's going to be binary 1. I can encode all kinds of data. Right? But, just, but if you open it up in a text editor, it's going to look exactly like the MIT license agreement. And maybe they will go on. Maybe they will leave you alone. That's all you really wanted here. Just leave me alone. Don't look. The biggest thing here is don't overthink it. Right? I promise you anything you do, it's going to be, it's going to be broken. You're not better than them unless you have a team. Here's the thing. Apple has a team probably bigger than your entire development pro uh, Your entire development team is probably smaller than Apple's team that just tries to stop jailbreaks. Apple controls all the hardware. They build their own hardware. They control the supply chain, the operating system, all the software. They control everything. Jailbreaks still happen. You're not going to beat that. But if you can do simple things, we can do it. Let's talk about one more. We're going to talk about Wi-Fi. This is a lot harder on attackers, but uh, they still can automate it. And I just want to show you one more tool. It is called, um, what is this tool called? I just it. Charles. I can't believe I forgot. So what does Charles do? Charles, uh, this, is a, this is a tool I, that I just built. It just sends a, a, a message up. And as you see, I'm, I'm sitting here watching the, the, uh, the traffic. This is over SSL. I can't read it. It's HTTPS. can't read it. Very good. Yay. Use HTTPS. Except, go on up, go on up. What I can do in Charles is I can set up my uh, proxy. And I can inject SSL certificates into the device. I did this on simulator, but this isn't simulator only. You can do this on a device. And this is a feature. The fact that you can put SSL certificates, trusted SSL certificates, is a feature, is, is there on purpose. Right? This isn't a hack. Right? Apple's not going to take this out. So I launch this up again, I run it, and now when I connect, or and then I, uh, I just am going to say, I'm going to watch it. And now it comes right up. What can I do to fix this? Certificate pinning. I'm not going to talk a ton about this. I have an entire talk on just this. But the thing is, why do we even need it? I'm just going to walk you through the basics. You expect that you're trusting these certificates, right? You're also trusting all these certificates. You're trusting 170 different certificates. Many of them you do not need to trust. I promise you because I put one of them in there myself, and I promise you you don't need to care about it. It's just used by Cisco. So what do you do instead? What you say is, I'm only going to trust, don't try to read this, I'm only going to try to trust my one certificate, the one I care about. Now the code for that is actually kind of long. It's kind of annoying. So what I've done is I've, I've just uh, put it together into a thing called Certificate Validator. Does it quick. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go a little, little fast. Other thing that I like to do is call Secret Knock. I just mean stick things in the header, right? Stick a API key. Don't let people come up to your server. Don't let them come to your API and just query it, right? Include, require something. And if it's not there, give them a 404. Right? If they don't include you, and not a 400, not an error, a nobody's home. This URL doesn't make sense. Again, we're trying to get rid of automated attacks. So what do I do? I just have some secret. Now, this isn't going to be highly secure at all. I'm just saying that my app has this hard-coded secret in it, and everybody has to use it, or the API ignores them. Sounds useless. I have had, personally, I was hired to implement an entire secure protocol for a company. They gave me a working version in Android, but they used a number of techniques like this. It took me, what, over a, about a week to implement this one little thing because I couldn't figure out how it worked. And I had the source code in Android. I mean, I could read exactly how it worked. An attacker. This stuff, this stuff can slow you down. <laughs> so what am I recommending? I suggest that you go out. You get things like Hopper and Charles yourself. Try it out. Spend a little bit of time. 
trying this stuff out. An hour, maybe, eh, it'd probably take you a day. Do not get hung up on this, but spend just a little bit of time. I don't care about that. What about money? What about things that are, that, what about if you actually have to do stuff? Obfuscation, am I out of time? We'll, we'll slide through. Should you? The answer is really probably no. Like, there are serious obfuscation tools out there. Most of them, though, are useless. <sighs> Nobody can figure this out, right? Nobody can figure out what this does. You all can figure out what it does. This is a date, you know, this pulls down Earl, you know, this is download code. Even if I jumble up everything, though, now it seems like I couldn't figure out what it does. But the problem is in the in hopper output, all the types are there, all of them. And this is very easy to read. You still know it's download code because that's the only thing that looks like this, right? I'm gonna fly through it. So what's the point? You can do something more advanced, which is hardening. These tools, though, are very expensive. Hardening makes debugging hard. It actually makes it hard to put a debugger on the program. It recognizes a debugger there, and it crashes. Or it doesn't crash, it just like, doesn't work. But these are very hard. They're very expensive. And they're probably not worth it for you. And you're going to have to keep upgrading it, because people figure out ways around all the hardening approaches. So. My goal is not, is you are probably here, you're at terrible. I want to get you up to basic, because otherwise you're going to just spend money and money and money and money and money. So what should you do? I want you to remember that obfuscation is for you, it is not for your users. Never, never, never use obfuscation to protect user data. You need encryption for that. Focus on the basics. Just get the strings out, right? And use Hopper and Charles. Secrets and lies.